Praise the Lord. I'd like to welcome all of our guests here this morning. If I have not gotten the chance to shake your hand, please hang around a moment and let me get back to the back. I'd love to shake your hand and uh, welcome you personally this morning. And um, I want to take a moment. I shared with you, with the congregation, Wednesday night, I thank you for your many, many prayers. You know, for about uh, three months now, I've been really struggling with my eye, my left eye, and the real big, the, the real, one of the real problems was the excruciating pain that I had, and I felt like someone was standing on my shoulder with an ice pick, just constantly jabbing it into my eye. Now, I don't know how you are with pain. I'm pretty good with pain. I can live with it. But this was unbearable, and it got to be so bad. And we finally, finally, we were changing doctors, finally got a, a doctor went in a couple of weeks ago, and they scheduled us for an ophthalmologist. Turns out, I think we found somebody said he's really good, Dr. Mills. Anybody know Dr. Mills? Uh, good, he's a, he's a good doctor. They went through about four hours of test, and then he says, Mr. Moore, I can't let you leave the office. I've got to do emergency eye surgery on you today. It turns out, I don't know what this means. I'm not a medical doctor, but the vitreous fluid that flows through your eye, that's the stuff that gives your eye nutrients. It's kind of like water and fertilize. So I wasn't getting any fertilized in my eyes it was because all the, it goes through four different ports and all four ports were plugged and so uh, I was they measured the pressure and it should be normally 14 mine was at almost 60 and at 70 your eye goes poof <laughs> it explodes so uh, we got there just in time thank the Lord knock on plastic and uh, <laughs> And the Lord uh, helped us there, and uh, but it did. Uh, he did do the surgery. That what they do is they put four new holes through your lens to to the pupil and allows the fluids to flow. And uh, after an hour of recovery, they checked me again. I was at 38 on the pressure, so it was coming down. And needless to say, I feel. A thousand percent better. Yeah. Hallelujah. I have lost better than 50 percent of the vision in my left eye, so I can't really see out of it. So you have to bear with me. If you if you're gonna throw something at me, give me a little warning. <laughs> Unless it's hundred dollar bills, I don't really know. <laughs> Let me know if you got a tomato coming my way. <laughs> But we go back in this coming week, he said, the other news is your other eye is doing the same thing. So I gotta have surgery on that. And uh, so we take, going in next week to figure out what's going on. So thank you for your continued prayers. I appreciate it. And uh, Donna, Donna said, I was almost too unbearable to live with. <laughs> Can you imagine, imagine me being so unbearable like that? <laughs> This little fuzzball up here. I mean, <clears throat> we've been preaching for a few weeks out of the book of Isaiah, starting in Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 35 and 36 says, cast not away therefore your, your confidence, which have great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience. A lot of people like writing in their Bibles. How many in here write in your Bibles along the margins? You might want to put right there for your name there. Have need of patience. Let me give you a hint. For Kevin has need of patience. Where'd Kevin go? <laughs> 
<laughs> he ran out of patience. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> yeah, okay. he's running. <laughs> For you have need of patience that after you've done the will of God, you might receive his promise. I've been preaching out of Isaiah 40 and 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I'm in a series entitled, Hurry Up and Wait. How many people like waiting? <laughs> this young lady right here, I mean, did your parents tell you that Christmas is canceled? <laughs> Can you wait till next year? <laughs> I don't think anyone in here likes waiting. We put up with waiting, and some of us are a little more patient than others. But uh, many of us do not have a lot of patience. And uh, we're talking about how patience helps to form you. God expects us to wait. Some things he does quickly, some things he does on his time. Someone said God's the slowest person to always be on time. Uh, sometimes he makes us wait. We get anxious during that waiting period. And so we're talking about where the word says, they show, uh, he said, to mount up with wings as eagles. We've been talking about that for a few Sundays here. We've been talking about the eagles. How many have been here through that? We told you several things just to highlight. We told you eagles fly alone at high altitude. Sometimes we have to separate us ourselves from situations that will drag us down. Hello? Sometimes you got to get above the freight. Not everybody you know is good for you. Not every friend you got may be the best thing for you. So you have to judge that and weigh that. Sometimes you have to get out of there and you have to get away from those other birds. You know? Eagles have strong vision. It's important that we keep our eyes open. I told you an eagle could see a rabbit for over two miles. How I envy an eagle. Not that I particularly like Rabbits, but I'd like to see two miles. <laughs> but we need to keep our vision clear. We told you eagles don't eat dead things. There's a lot of things in our lives that, that, that are non-productive, and we need to cut them out. They're, they're just bring death to us, and we need to figure it out and get rid of it. We, uh, one of the more controversial things we told you is eagles just love a storm. In fact, when they feel a storm coming, they start to flutter. They get excited, and they will fly directly towards that storm. And uh, we need to understand something. Storms, uh, the storms of life can lift, lift us up higher. Amen. The things that we go through in life can make us, uh, can lift us up higher. You, we told you that eagles have to test before they can trust. We gave you the illustration how I... An eagle courts her mate. When she's ready to mate, she goes up, she finds a twig, she goes up, flies a certain height, and she drops the twig, and the male eagle will chase the twig, and he has to catch it before it hits the ground. When he does, he brings it back to her. She does it again, a little bit higher. He brings it back, she does it again, a little bit higher. She brings it back, does it again, a little bit higher. She's testing her mate to see if he is committed. We have to use things that have been tested. The Word of God has been tested. The armor of God has been tested. And so we have to understand that, that we need to use things that be, being t uh, that has been tested. Eagles live in high places. That's where no predators can reach them. Amen. That's where they live. We need to 
Get out of the gutter. Amen. Stop living down. I'm going to be careful. We make our homes in places that they ought not be. And we wonder why we go through so many problems. We wonder why we have so many issues in our life. The truth is, is because that's where you live. Someone once said, you made your bed, now lie in it. Well, God doesn't want you to live down there. He wants you to live in the high ground. See? He wants you to live above that. Stop living in the devil's playground. Remember me saying that. Now I want to move on today. A couple, a couple more things that I think is important. There's my page. I knew I'd find it if I looked one more time. An eagle is the only bird that can look directly into the sun. Did you know that? I know one person knew that. I read it in her book last week, or a week before. It's the only bird that can look directly into the sun. They have two sets of eyelids. One is used for hunting while the other is used while they're flying directly into the sun. When an eagle is being pursued by an enemy, another bird, they will fly directly into the sun and the other bird will be following them looking directly into the sun it will blind them they will have to divert their route and the eagle is then safe i want to challenge you that when you're being pursued by the enemy you need to fly or run directly toward the sun amen s-o-s yeah. directly toward the son of god we try a lot of things before we try Jesus. We try to figure it out ourselves. We try to get somebody else to figure it out for us. We'll talk to the bank. Can you solve my financial crisis? We'll talk to the, to, to the doctor. Can you fix me? And those are all good. But I want to tell you something. You need to try Jesus when you're facing your, uh, when an enemy is chasing you. If you're running from him, run towards the sun. Amen. That bird or that enemy will see the sun and he will depart. The Bible said if you if you submit yourself <clears throat> to the Lord and, and resist the devil, he will flee from you. That's right. Amen. 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 We need to run to Jesus. Nobody enjoys the feeling of being vulnerable to danger. I don't like that. I don't like... There's a reason I don't live in Florida anymore. God delivered me from Florida. No, I like alligators. They're tasty. They won't bother you. But I'm telling you something that will. There's a lot of snakes in Florida. There's only four poisonous varieties of snakes in North America. Florida has all four of them. Yeah. And different varieties of those species. But I don't like being vulnerable. And I've shared with you, there was a time when I broke my back and I was flat on my back. Actually on a board. I was too young for surgeries. Thank goodness that didn't happen until later. But uh, I was laying on the bed, and we had what we call the French windows in Florida. Because uh, when it rains in Florida, which is every day at 4 o'clock, <laughs> you want the windows that you can open and it not rain in them. So you get the French windows. So I had those windows there, but it wasn't raining, and I'm laying in my bed right by the window, so I got it open wide open because it's hot 
another problem with Florida. Yeah. It's hot down there. And I was laying there, my mother was out on the back side of the property working in the, the garden. Everybody was going and I couldn't walk. I had a broken back. I couldn't get up, I couldn't move. And all of a sudden I noticed something moving. On my left side, I look up on the window, there's a snake laying on the window. And he's just crawling all over that beautiful glass. And I don't think snakes can see, they can't see, can they? Can they see? I don't know, I haven't talked to one lately. But they use their tongue, they stick that out and they can sense heat. Well, I got news for you. About that time, I was getting really hot. <laughs> I was sweating. And I looked over and he started pushing up against that screen and our screens weren't in that well. And I just knew any moment he was gonna go through that screen. I was a dead man. I don't know what kind of snake it was. Don't matter, it would still kill me. <laughs> My heart would have said, you're out of here. So I couldn't get my mom before the days of cell phones. I mean, we had cells, but most of our relatives were in them. <laughs> and nobody had a phone. So my only option was to try to get rid of that snake myself. And I thought there's a broom laying there. And I go through the motion and say, what would happen if I reached up and hit that snake? that screen with that broom. My first thought is my broom was gonna go right through that screen. That snake's gonna grab that broom and right up my leg he's gonna come. I said, that's not a good, I ruled that one out. So I very, very gently got over to the window like this, like I'm gonna jump, it ain't gonna do me no good, I can't go nowhere. And I started cranking it down. And pretty soon I got it at about a 45. They got, you know, snakes can hang on. So I got it at about 45 and then a little bit further. All of a sudden, finally, he fell. I got news for you. <clears throat> I never opened that window again. I burned up. We don't like it when we're vulnerable to danger. I don't think any of us like that. We don't like it when there's a predator chasing us. But I've got news for you. You've got an enemy after you. The enemy of your soul is after you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to, to, to make you, uh, he wants to impact your life in every way that he possibly can. Amen. But you don't have any insurance against that. You know, how many know what insurance is good for? Huh? How many have insurance? Some days I'm wondering. But recently I read an article about an insurance company that started insurance for dogs and cats. We were up at the dog place, the pet place. Well, we had our cats, so what was the cat place that day? But 57 million homes in America own cats. 51 million owns dogs. So the market is ripe. So this insurance company is expecting a great response to provide comprehensive health care for their beloved animals. And I know that people love their animals. They love their animals, and that's wonderful. How many people love cats? <laughs> See me after church. <laughs> I've got one for you. <laughs> but a lot of people don't apply for that in church. We went in the other day, our poor cat had gotten hurt. We took him in, it was gonna cost us three or $4,000 to fix this feral cat that lives in our attic. 
And I said, baby, I'm going to take it. I said, well, how much would it take to euthanize him? They said about $500. Wow. Yeah, don't go there. <laughs> so I looked at my baby and I said, honey, let's take the kitty home. <laughs> Before you make a judgment against me, I meant so we could pray privately for the cat. We kept the cat and took it home and it healed up. Now it's just normal as can be. It was going to cost us $5,000 to fix that cat with what little peroxide and salve did. But the Bible has so many insurance policies for us, and we fail to apply for them. We fail to apply them in our lives. There's an enemy that wants to destroy you. You've got somebody coming against you, but you've got the Word of God that will strengthen you. David said, the Lord is my light, my deliverer. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I got news for you this morning. Jesus wants to bring you that protection. Amen. He's able to do that. You see, the promises of God are so misappropriated uh, and underappropriated and totally neglected that we live below what God has for us. That's right. You know, God wants to protect you. Psalm 71. I run to the Lord for protection. I'm reading from the message. I run to the Lord for protection. Don't disappoint me. You do what is right, so come to my rescue. Listen to my prayer and keep me safe. Be my mighty rock and place where I can always run for protection. Save me for, by your command that you might be my mighty rock and my fortress. We sang about that this morning. We have a shelter. We have a fortress. Amen. We have a protector. We have a God that's ever present in our lives. We have someone to take care of us. I've got an insurance policy and it's Jesus Christ this morning. He takes care of things that I can't take care of. He does things that I can't solve. He takes care of me when nobody else can fix it. Amen. Hallelujah. Run to the Lord for protection. He goes on in that 10th verse. It says, My enemies are plotting against me. They want me dead. 12th verse, he says, Come closer, God. Please hurry and help. I like the way Gene wrote this particular section. He said, please come and help. Sometimes we've got to say, please hurry up, God. I need your help. I need your touch today. I can't go another day. I can't live on yesterday's touch. I need a brand new touch from God. My strength from yesterday is gone. And I can't make it through to tomorrow. I need a brand new touch. My enemies are plotting against me. They want me dead. The Bible said... John 10 and 10, I believe, he said that Satan comes but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He wants you dead. He wants to destroy you. He wants you, he wants you strung out on drugs. Come on. Come on, pal. He wants you to become an alcoholic. Right. He wants you to do everything that's negative in your life. That's right. He wants you to fall apart. He doesn't want you whole. He doesn't want you healthy. That's your enemy. That's the one that's come to kill, to steal, and destroy. But Jesus goes on to say, but I have come that you might have life, and you might have that more abundantly. You understand something? My insurance policy against Satan is Jesus Christ. That's right. Hallelujah. Run to Jesus. We need that hedge of protection. 
ever thought about that? In the first chapter of Job, God points out that Satan, points out to Satan that Job was a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil. You know what Satan said? Does, Yah, does Job fear God for nothing? Has you not placed a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? Think about that for just a moment. Do you think that's what you think that's what Job knew or what God knew? You think Satan knew that? He said, I can't get to Job. There's a hedge there. You've got a, you've got a, a, a something around him that I can't get through. Hallelujah. Did you know that you can have that hedge around you? Amen. It's common for Christians to adapt that verse and pray for a hedge of protection. Around a friend or a family member, but very few people really understand the original inspiration behind that phrase. I want to share that with you this morning. In the Old Testament, wild animals were more prevalent than in the Middle East than they are today. The Bible mentions lions in the book of Judges. It mentions wolves in the book of Jeremiah, bears in the book of Samuel, lepers in Hosea, hyenas in, in Isaiah. Now, a stone wall could keep predators away from the living area, but the walls would have to be very tall and would take a great deal of time to build. Well, wood would be easier, but the, it was not as plentiful. They couldn't find the wood to build the fences. So instead of that, a hedge of thorns. Right. By the lands are full of thorn bushes. A hedge of thorns could be introduced to grow around a compound. They could plant them and they would grow up and they would be so thick that nothing could get through it. Too dense to crawl through too sharp to chew through, too deep for all, but the most determined leper to jump over. A hedge would be uh, a deterrent and a protector for those sheep. You see, God raises up a hedge. He said in our times of trouble that he would raise up a standard or a hedge against us. Satan is like a lion that's looking at whom he may devour. A thorn hedge is an appropriate metaphor to, de to declare that it would keep him away. Let me tell you something this morning. In Deuteronomy 28 and 7, he says this, the Lord shall cause thine enemies to rise up against you to be smitten before your face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee from you seven ways. That's right. Hallelujah. Come on, Pastor. They'll come against you. Start living in victory. They'll come against you one way. They'll flee from you seven ways. We walk in victory. We live in victory. Hello? Come on, Pastor. God causes victory. God brings victory. Hallelujah. How's he do that? Some of you have been fighting for a long time. You've been struggling for a long time. Your enemy has come against you. He has zapped you. He has slapped you. He has given you his best shot. God wants you to win. That's right. That's right. Amen. As God's design for you is to win. God gets no glory out of you failing. Hallelujah. Come on, Pastor. You say, I can't do this by myself. You're absolutely right. There you go. You need Christ and you need us. We Amen. need you. We need each other. Yes. Hallelujah. But you need to get into Christ. You need to run towards him. Psalms 91. One of my favorite chapters. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Think about that. Hallelujah. 
referring to the angel wings compared to an eagle's wings. He understands something. We're going to be under the shadow of the Most High. I will say of the Lord, He's my refuge. He's my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisy, uh, noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shall you trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. God loves you so much that He will do you like a mother hen would do her chicks. He will cover you with His wings. He will protect you with His wings. When the enemy comes towards you, He will see that nothing happens to you because He's covered you. Amen. Amen. He's covering you this morning. Run to him. Proverbs 2, 6 and 8. I'm reading from the message again. God gives out wisdom free. He's he is plain spoken in knowledge and understanding. His rich, he is rich. He has a rich mind of common sense for those who will live there. A personal bodyguard to the candid and sincere. Think about that. Your personal bodyguard. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Who's ever th wished you had a bodyguard? Some of you hadn't needed one, I, I, I can only assume. But if you need one, you wish you had one. Now, I grew up with seven. <laughs> personal bodyguards you didn't mess with my sisters they took care of little brother well I was little at the time he's our personal bodyguard to the candid and sincere he keeps his eye on all who live honestly he pays special attention to his loyal, committed ones. But there's a catch. There's a catch to it this morning. going to turn the sprinklers on in just a second. <laughs> Part of the illustration. You have to stay under the umbrella of his protection. You have to stay under the umbrella of his protection. Don't expect God to keep you from getting wet if you're doing this. Now, Sometimes, again, sometimes in Florida, you have to do it like this. Because it does rain sideways, usually. We have to stay under his protection. God wants you under his wings. Amen. Hallelujah. We'll fight. We will struggle. We will do everything we can do to get out from that umbrella. Out from that, those wings out from under that safe haven we have to understand something that when we walk away from God and from his will for us we give the devil permission to come over into our lives and do us harm if you are playing in the devil's playground you're playing in the devil's playground hello now, I wasn't the fearless, the, the most fearless guy in high school. I knew there were some places on the playground I was better to stay away from. Because those guys would whoop you. And if you might have noticed, I'm not that fast of a runner. I mean, I wouldn't have a problem with it if I could do a six minute mile. My junior year, I, I broke my record 
I did a 12 minute mile, isn't it awesome? <laughs> Without falling down. <laughs> but when you give the devil permission, you step out from God's protection, you're, you, you got a target on your back. That's right. I, I see so many people, some of you are gonna take this hard. I see so many people in churches that come in and then they wander away and they get under attack. They get beaten up. Come on. Their children get pregnant. They get on drugs. They get into situations that they can't get out of. And then, then they want to come back to God for a for a quick fix. You see, once you walk out, that's what usually happens. Am I saying that nothing ever happens to a Christian? No, that's not what I'm saying. But when you step out into the devil's uh, playground, you're open game. You're a target for him. You have to stay under that umbrella. Uh, the scripture tells us and indicates that we have angelic protection. It's available to us when we're around God. We have angels that are watching over us. Angels that are encamped around us, about us, and they're taking care of us. When you walk with God, He will walk with you. When you walk away from God, you're on your own. Amen. Hallelujah. Psalms 94 and 11. He will give his angels charge over you. But we can't expect God to give the same degree of protection when we're walking in disobedience and doing our own thing. Psalms 34 and 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those that fear him, who revere him, worship him. And each of them he delivers. How many will stay with me five minutes? Come on, Pastor. Keep your hands up. <laughs> What's five times 22? I got plenty of time, right? I'll get you out just a moment. An hour and 40 minutes. So I'm going to end with this. An eagle can renew its youth. Boy, that sounds good, don't it? Amen. Man, I could use some renewed youth. Amen. Hello? I found out what over the hill means. <laughs> that doesn't mean you get to go faster. <laughs> that was the case when you were driving your car, maybe. When an eagle grows old, his feathers become weak. And it cannot take him as fast or as far as he should. He feels weak and about ready to die. He retires to a place far away in the rocks. While he's there, he will pluck out every feather on his body. Till it's completely bare. Those of you that are going around the churches where angel feathers are falling. <laughs> Hello? They're telling you that angel is dying. I wouldn't want to be in that church. Oops. Come on. That wasn't even in the message. You get it later. There's a preview. He stays in this hiding place until he grows brand new feathers. Then he comes out. You see, sometimes we have to go to a hiding place. Sometimes God will put you in a hiding place. Yep. He'll put you in a place that you don't want to be, perhaps. He'll put you in a place where nobody else can find you. He'll put you in a place that does not seem attractive. It's a rocky place. It's a rough place. It's an uncomfortable place. But he will put you there in order to renew you. You see, you want restoration in your life, restoration in your spiritual life. Sometimes it's not an easy thing. It's not easy to be restored. It's not e restoration is not an easy process because it's painful. Spiritually, physically, and emotionally, it's painful when you go through a restoration process. Amen. Hallelujah. 
I'm going to fly through this section for a second. But I want to tell you something. There are times that we need to lay aside every weight and the sin. We need to pluck it off. Now, we don't mind getting a trim. We don't mind getting a close shave. But we don't want to take it and have it all plucked out. God said, there's times you need to get rid of everything. If I'm going to start, I'm going to start brand new. I'm going to start new in your life. It's, this is an endurance race. You see, that's, that's the thing about Christianity. It's a race. Yes, it is. But it's an endurance race. You see, it doesn't just end. We've got to keep running. And it runs easier without the weight. Yes. When, when, tra when training for a race, a lot of times people wear weights around their ankles and around their wrists. They will train. Then when the race day comes, they'll get rid of that weight. You see, there are things that weight us down. And we need to get rid of them so we can run this, patient, this race with patience that's set before us. The endurance race is hard enough. When you're running light, but it's even harder, and it's sometimes even impossible when you are weighed down with things in your life. Several things here I want to share real quickly. You need to run that race on purpose. Amen. You need to decide, you need to make up your mind today. I'm going to run the race. Stop getting in and out. Hello? Stop getting in and out. Make a decision. Decide, I'm going to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Make a decision, you're going to follow Jesus. Don't follow him on Sunday mornings and then put him on the shelf on Monday. Follow him every day of your life. Live for him. It's something that we do on, pers on purpose. We, set, we start this race on purpose. We run this race on purpose. And we finish this race on purpose. Amen. You have to stay Focus. See, you don't run aimlessly. You see, you got a, you got a pathway to run. You see, they give you a pathway to run. A lot of times in track and field and running, you'll have a lane assigned to you. And if you get out of that lane, you're disqualified. See, one of the things we do is we get we switch from lane to lane. We have to understand something. You have to run with aimless. You have to run uh, with aim in your in your life. The Lord gives us each a unique race. Your race is not like mine. I'm not like you. You can't run my race. I can't run your race. Stay in your lane. Get out of my lane. If you know what's good for you, stay out of my lane because I'll run you over. <laughs> stay in your own lane. You gotta, you gotta stay focused. Yeah. Run towards heaven. Yeah. Continue on what God's called you to do. Yes. He said, "Then you're gonna renew. You renew." Ron's gonna preach out of Romans tonight, but Romans 12 and one and two says, "I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves a living, your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service." Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yeah. See, the eagle renews herself. So what's it all about to be renewed? How can you be renewed? You see, we're being transformed into the likeness of Christ. That word implies a radical and thorough change, both outward and inward. The whole life of the person has to be changed. Now, it's not easy. It's not easy. Transitions takes place, saying about it this morning, from the inside out. It is something that we do from the inside out. Now, transitions have three different stages, and I'm going to say them real quick. It has an ending, it has a neutral zone, and it has a beginning, a new beginning. The ending, the old situations, the old relationships, the old job, the old place. The, that's the process of letting go. 
You honor the old, but you let it go. That's the past. It's done. It's over. The neutral zone, that's the in-between time. Everything seems to be at a stop. No man, you're in no man's land. Moving around but not going anywhere. The main thing there is to try not to hurry up. Don't hurry that section up. Try, and trying to figure out things. Just be, uh, be at the center of yourself and wait. Hope, wait on God. We told you that's what patience was. Waiting expectantly. Then there's the new beginnings. That can grow out of the neutral zone. But only when the time is right. When God is ready, you grow out of it. Now the hardest part to me is the neutral zone. I've been there. That's the sometimes large no, man land, no man's land between the ending and the beginning. It could be a season of dormancy in your life. It could be a cold season. It's a place where everything seems to break up before you can grab it. And even there seems nothing that you can grab onto. There's no formula here to get out of it, only time. Transformation is a process. We need to allow God to transform us, yeah. renew Amen. us. We need to mount up with wings as eagles. To be up there with him. Hallelujah. To be caught up with him. Allow God to help you this morning. Oh, and we talk about these many areas in your life. But especially this morning. Perhaps you're facing an enemy. You've been running from that enemy, but you've been running to all the wrong places. Looking for help in all the wrong places. Maybe you need to run to Jesus this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you're going through the renewing process. Maybe you're at the beginning stages. That's when you have to let go of the past. Maybe you're in the neutral stage. Don't seem like anything's happened, like you're spinning your wheels. But maybe you're in the new beginning stage. I want to challenge you this morning to allow God to work the process in you. Because He wants to renew you. Amen. He doesn't want to stay. He doesn't want you to stay. If there's something that He needs to take care of in that new process, let Him. When He's ready, He'll move you on. Would you stand with us? I want to ask you something this morning. Why ever had this bowed and never had his closed, if you would. If you're here this morning, and you say, Pastor, you were talking to me. Whatever stage of the sermon, whatever you've been struggling with, I say, God has opened my eyes on some things this morning. I want to make some changes. And I want to start them today. I don't want to wait till tomorrow. Whatever that need is in your life, slip your hand up and back down quickly as we pray. God bless you right where you're at. God can change you. Hallelujah. You know me, it's not my job to parade you around like a trophy this morning. I just want to pray with you right where you're at. So you're admitting to God and to yourself that you you need to make those changes. You're going to start today. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you this morning for every hand that was raised in this building. God, we know that you're trying to work some change in people's life. Father, you're trying to protect some people, but God, some of them are stepping out from under the umbrella. Well, this morning they want to step back under that umbrella. And I pray this morning, God, that you help them. Let them know you will receive them with open arms this morning. Father, we pray for strength. God, right now, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm going to open the altars up. And I think some of you need to be around these altars and praying this morning. Giving it to Jesus. Running to Him this morning. Hallelujah. Running to Him this morning. 
Amen. So would you join us around these altars as we pray as Kevin sings this song. If you don't feel like you need to pray, that's fine. Just stay right where you're at. But many of you in this room needs to pray. Would you join us as we sing this song? Great.